I could talk to the animals. Just imagine it, chatting with a chimp and chimpanzee. Imagine talking to a tiger, chatting with a chimp. Jersey Veg Radio is brought to you by Pure Abundance Cheese. Pure Abundance makes their 100% vegan artesian cheese at their cheese lab in Atlanta's Old Fourth Ward. They combine traditional methods with modern technology to create a cultured and aged cashew cheese that is kind to your body and this planet. Pure Abundance Cheese offers two amazing cheeses. Luna Cashew Cheese, which is a creamy, buttery cheese with full-bodied flavor, and a pan cashew cheese, which is a deliciously herb-covered cheese with a tangy, citrusy flavor. These cheeses are simply delicious on their own and amazing on a cracker, in a salad, on a sandwich, or baked in a casserole. The possibilities to use it are endless. Pure Abundance fans are omnivores, vegans, and anyone who loves eating delicious cheese. Seriously. It is so good that you will dream about it. In fact, your favorite Curiously Veg radio hosts are addicted to these tasty cheeses. Visit their website at pureabundancefood.com for locations where you can purchase Pure Abundance cheese, and you can also locate local restaurants that have mouth-watering dishes that are made with their artesian cheese. They also offer home delivery, so you don't have to miss out on these delectable cheeses. So check them out and discover just how good cheese can be. Visit pureabundancefood.com and sign up for their newsletter and make sure you follow them on social media so you don't miss out on any of the recipes and events. You're listening to Curiously Veg Radio, WCVR, featuring the vegan renegade and the geek. I don't know. I'm still going off the Deadpool thing. We need, we need to see Deadpool again. That was fantastic. I agree. That, that was, was awesome. And it's not for kids. No, it is not. It is not for kids. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. No. And now but that, it was good. Now, now that we've started uh, formally addressing everybody, hey guys, hey welcome guys. to uh, episode <clears throat> episode 11. We're on now of uh, Curiosity Veg Radio. Um, with you as always are your hosts Dave the Geek and of course Hope the freaking Renegade. <laughs> nah, I'm the vegan renegade. But you can call me the frickin' renegade if you want to. Frickin', frickin renegade. renegade. <laughs> if, if you would kind of introduce uh, introduce what we have going on here to everybody. <laughs> well, I don't even understand that question. Okay. If you would, please introduce what we have going on here today to everybody. <laughs> you all right, Filthy? Yeah, I'm good. Go all right. All right. Well, what we are and who we are is Curiously Veg, of course. What is Curiously Veg? Curiously Veg is a movement that will bridge the gap between vegans, vegetarians, and those who are curious about how to incorporate a plant-based lifestyle for better health. Our show is a perfect place to answer the question, you're, are you Curiously Veg? That sounded really lame. That's okay. I really thought we could work that, that catchphrase in. Honestly, I'm, I'm, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a work in progress, I think. So. I'm we'll always a work in progress. We'll I'm just, Have I'm, you met me? I'm just a hot man. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. Yeah. So and uh, of course, uh, if you're listening to this for the first time or you've been listening to us for a while, you can always subscribe to the show by going to curiosityvegradio.com/slash-subscribe. If you're on a mobile device, you can tap the iOS button or Android button. It'll take you uh, to a place to go ahead and sign up, or even suggest apps you can use. If you actually have an app installed, like um, uh, Stitcher or Pocket Cast. Tap on one of the app buttons that's on that page, and it'll take you right to your app page. You can subscribe and add it right to your uh, podcatcher of choice. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you if you're already following us and on iTunes, and we got a few followers on iTunes, I can I, I can see the numbers. Yeah. Uh, give us some uh, some stars, some reviews. Um, I kind of every now and then I go and check and see if we have any. We haven't got any reviews yet, so we'd love to hear some I feedback. I feel so unloved. Here's some, you can see some. Uh, we we'll see some five stars. Come on, guys, give us some, give us some, give, pump us up a little bit. Basically, what Dave's saying is we're everywhere. Yes. You can we're, find us everywhere. Yeah. We're you, lurking in your corners. We're in your cupboards. We're everywhere. Absolutely. If you can't find us, go to our Facebook page or even go to our, uh, our website, curiouslyvegradio.com. Click on contact and uh, shoot us an email saying you can't find us on your app or anywhere, and uh, I'll help you out and get us uh, get you subscribed. And if, if you kind of like what we're doing here, if you want to help us out, if you go to curiouslyvegradio.com slash support. You can, it gives you options. Or we have a store with uh, some fantastic uh, artwork by our uh, our resident audio and audio and video man here, uh, Matt Hughes. You can find his art at matthewsart.com. Uh, he did some he's doing some awesome work for us. We have uh, prints, signed prints for sale, as well as you can get it on T-shirts and mugs and all kinds of stuff. You can also, if you want to help us out by uh, you know just donating 
Or we also have uh, like Thrive and Audible we work with. Um, signing up for those through affiliate links helps us as well. And on that page, you can see what that help goes towards as far as equipment and just getting in uh, people to interview and things like that. And we have a link to our, our, Am- our Amazon site. So if you're looking for something like a book to order on Amazon, it doesn't cost you anything to use our link. It just throws us a couple of bucks to help us pay to bring the show to you. So if you love it, you know, you use our use our link. And when we talk about books like uh, the books that our guest has today, we have a really exciting guest today, but oh, yeah. um, order it through our site. Like I said, costs you nothing and helps us out. And when you visit our page, you get to see, you know, the wonderful people that sponsor us that help us bring this show to you guys. And, and hopefully we'll continue bringing the show to you guys for a long time. Absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're, on, we're on 11. We have uh, episode 12 and 13 already kind of lined up. Which are awesome. Fantastic. I tell you, if you, if you, if you said we started this back uh, November 1st, I believe, is when our first episode came out. Yeah. If you told us on November 1st, that we would be doing some of the interviews today alone, but what we have coming up and everyone we have we're talking to, I, I wouldn't believe you'd be like, there's there's no way we're gonna get these people on to actually have sit down have a conversation with us. It's fantastic. Especially our guest today. Yeah, and who was uh who was our guest today? There. I was I was so Big excited. Renegade. Yeah, I was so excited because I've actually you know been following his organization. I've read his book, um, Gene Bauer. He is the co-founder and president of Farm Sanctuary, which is it's an amazing farm they've got three now and i hopefully will see it continue spreading on he was on john stewart which i think probably everybody knows him from there because that got him some good exposure but farm sanctuary is america's leading um, farm animal protection organization it's pretty big and gene bauer has been held as the conscience of the food movement by time magazine which is pretty because wow. we've seen some stuff on time like you know yeah, oh, eat the butter yeah. and the bacon, but <laughs> you know, to have him on there it just shows that we're he he's breaking boundaries with compassion with animals and veganism. Um, in fact, for about 25 years, he's traveled extensively um, to campaign to raise awareness for the abuses and of what happens in industrialized fa- factory farming and how that brings us to cheap food, how that's affecting us and the animals. Absolutely. Um, in fact, he's got his latest book out, which is the one I've read, is um, it was published by Burdell. It's called Living the Farm Sanctuary Life, The Ultimate Guide to Eating Mindfully, Living Longer, and Feeling Better Every Day. And uh, we'll have a link to that in our show notes. So uh, if after you listen to the interview that we did, and he he has he says some just great things. I, I we could have talked to him for hours. Right, I think yeah we <laughs> we could yeah. have. I mean seriously. <laughs> um, but without further ado, here's our interview with um, Gene Bauer. We hope you like it, and stay tuned for after. We'll have a little follow up thoughts on our wonderful interview. All right, guys. See you soon. Cool. So uh, again, uh, thank you for uh, being on uh, Curacy Veg Radio. And uh, congratulations on your 30th anniversary, the Farm Sanctuary. Yeah, it's been a long time, man. It's it's <laughs> great to see the kind of awareness though that exists now. We're much, we've come a long way in 30 years. Absolutely, doing some fantastic work, and we follow you all through all social media, and we're just all the photos and videos that you post are fantastic. And you have three farms now, is that correct? That is right. We have one in Watkins Glen, New York, and two in California. One in the northern part of the state, and one just outside of Los Angeles. Awesome. Yeah. What do you, what, what do you, what do you, what was your inspiration? What are your goals from, from the Farm Sanctuary? Well, Farm Sanctuary started in 1986, and at the time there was very little awareness about factory farming, and we felt it was important to investigate and expose these places so people knew what was happening, and so we began without really a long-term plan of creating these farms and doing the sort of programs we've we've come to to do. Um, We just wanted to right a wrong to shine the light on a cruelty and an injustice and let consumers know that they have a choice. They can be conscious about the way they eat and that the way they eat has profound impacts on other animals, on themselves and on the planet. I was reading in your book um, when you went to investigate these farms and you saw these animals who were not deceased and how you rescued them. That that was very impactful of and I don't think. Many people know that. They think that it's this nice little farm, all the animals are happy, and then they're happily walking up and they're, they just go to sleep. But you yeah. shed a good light on it. It's, it's kind of awakening to see that. Was that a shock to you to see that? It was. Um, in the early days, I felt it was very important to see firsthand what was happening. So I spent a lot of time going into farms, stockyards, and slaughterhouses to document conditions. 
And sometimes we would literally find living animals thrown in trash cans or on piles of dead animals. So we started rescuing them. And, and that was partly to heal ourselves as well. You know, obviously when you see an animal there, you want to help the animal. But when you see so much ugliness and cruelty at human hands, it's also very disturbing. And to be able to do something concrete and positive in the midst of that and rescue animals off of dead piles and bring them to the sanctuary and watch them heal, mm -hmm. uh, help to heal us as well. And I think Farm Sanctuary continues to be a place of hope and healing and transformation. And we try to model a different kind of relationship with these animals where they're our friends, not our food, where we all benefit from that kind of a peaceful, positive relationship instead of the sort of violence that is the norm in animal agriculture. Um, you know, I often, when I'm speaking, ask people to think about what it would be like to work in a slaughterhouse, where for eight hours a day, a person's job is cutting an animal's throat. You know, that's a violent, bloody job for the person. And it's obviously terrible for the animal, but it's not good for the people either. So, you know, a key part of our message is that it's about kindness. It's about living in alignment with our compassionate values. And most people are humane. So if we can just encourage people to live in alignment with their own values, I think we're going to see a massive shift. And, and some, some good things are really happening now. Absolutely. That's, that's very powerful <clears throat> on two fronts. I think that, for one, they just released a form yesterday showing how many accidents and how many deaths happen in the slaughterhouses. And people realize, like, well, you're vegan, but what are you doing for the humans? Well, this is also, you know, not only are we loosening up food that could feed people that we're feeding to farm animals, but the slaughterhouse conditions for humans are atrocious. And yes. then the biggest thing that I think, and I would like your input on this, is we have such a cognitive dissonance is when you go in that grocery store and you see prepackaged food, you don't see the animal. You see this, this piece of it. Yeah. And I think if animals or people got in there and saw what happened to them or if they had to call the animal themselves, I think they'd have a different perspective. How do you feel about that? I think that's right. Most people are humane, but most people are also unwittingly supporting this horrendous system and the violence of slaughter. And most people, unfortunately, don't think enough. And, you know, I grew up without thinking about it. I was eating meat like everybody around me. Most people go along with what everybody around them is doing. And so we grow up eating meat and we just assume that that is the norm and that that is appropriate. But as time goes, and as we learn more, and as more people become vegan, um, I think there will be more examples for others to see and recognize that not eating animals is a viable option. Mm -hmm. You know, the more vegans there are, I think the more vegans there will be, because we are social animals, we mm -hmm. learn from those around us, right. and we, you know, if, if there's no example of a vegan lifestyle, uh, we don't even know it exists or is possible. So the more examples there are, um, I think the more ultimately it's going to rub off and it will continue to grow. Speaking of, uh, of um, others going vegan and uh, choosing that lifestyle, what is, what, can you describe your story of you going to that lifestyle and, uh, and, and going plant-based and kind of why? Yeah. Well, I grew up in Los Angeles, California, in fact, Hollywood. And as a kid, I actually did commercials for places like McDonald's without really thinking about it again. <laughs> right. Um, and then in college, I started learning more about environmental impacts of animal agriculture. Um, but I didn't recognize that being vegan was an option. Um, I heard about how veal calves were raised, and I said I'd never eat veal again. So I had these aspects. But then when I started meeting people who were vegetarian and vegan and recognized that this was an actual option, I thought, you know, if I could live well without causing unnecessary harm, why wouldn't I? So I went vegan in 1985. Um, I was hitchhiking around the country at the time, getting involved with various activist groups like Greenpeace, for example, and then co-founded Farm Sanctuary in 1986 to take on this issue that was not getting the attention it needed. And um, there's a lot more awareness now and more organizations working on this, which is a good thing. But we're up against a massive industry, so mm -hmm. there's still an awful lot still to do. Absolutely. This is one of the, the biggest questions I get um, asked, how do I feel about non-vegan companies buying vegan companies? I think it's a good thing because, like, let's just take Tom's, for example. I know it's not a completely vegan line, but it enabled a healthier toothpaste to get in Target, to get in places that most people can't buy healthier stuff if you're in areas like from our hometown of Greenwood. It's, there's nothing there. 
but Target, Walmart, and places like that are getting it. Do you, how do you feel about the non-vegan companies buying these things? Yeah, well, I think that we live in a country that is very capitalist and materialist. And, <laughs> yes. <you> know, really? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, it seems that way. <laughs> um, and so, and people buy products. Uh, and to the extent that vegan products could be made more widely available, that is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that that is a generally net positive development, generally. Um, there are concerns that, you know, say a large company buys a smaller brand that is ethically operated and has certain values that the big company might influence and sort of lower and mm -hmm. undermine some of the the basic value so there's some legitimate concerns yeah. there sure. um but i think a lot depends on how the merger occurs mm -hmm. and what sorts of ar agreements are made in that process mm -hmm. but there's certainly examples of how big bad companies uh you know dean foods for example which is a big dairy company right. Right. uh bought silk a mm -hmm. number of years ago and silk became much more widely available. Yep. And now the and, and then interestingly, Dean Foods sold it, thinking that silk had kind of plateaued and hit its its top watermark. Mm -hmm. And they sold, and silk continues growing. So they actually lost. So they helped it grow, <laughs> and then got out and aren't profiting anymore. So yeah. you have you know it's a, it's an interesting complex business world. Um, and you know to the extent that vegan food is more widely available, that is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also think that it opens up opportunities for new innovative companies right. to be created. So Tom's goes, you know, big corporate, for example, or whoever mm -hmm. it is goes big corporate. Then there's, I think, going to be some smaller ones that pop up. Exactly. And I'm personally a fan of local, organic, veganic, community-oriented food production businesses. I you love know, veganic. Like, That's just great. Oh God, veganic, all plant-based, you know. Yeah. And, you know, it's... You know, in terms of veganic, my thinking on that is also somewhat evolving. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of, you know, growing food in a respectful way where we're not harming the earth and we're not harming other animals, that is the goal. Mm -hmm. But just being on earth, you know, we interact with nature and animals. And so now I'm thinking the goal really is to create mutually beneficial relationships with ourselves and with other animals and with the earth. And, and that, to me, is what being vegan is. It's about mm -hmm. living as kindly as possible and trying to create mutually beneficial relationships. You hit the nail um, on the head. Right. So veganic agriculture is a, a, an evolving sort of area. It's, I think, related to permaculture, mm -hmm. regenerative, organic, um, you know, sustainable, all these terms. But there's also, I think, a concern that some of those terms now are starting to be co-opted by some companies that are not very sustainable or organic and that's yeah. kind of an issue too right yeah I, I, one thing that we we, we like to uh, we always uh try to get in front of people is what would you tell someone who is who's new to being plant-based what it was what's some advice you would give someone who's new um i would say somebody who is new to becoming to going vegan or becoming plant-based is just to stay the course um recognize that in some cases they're it might be uncomfortable that you're the only one ordering a certain way, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and so there's some social challenges and pressures. Um, and I would also say that if early on you don't stay perfect on it, don't let that cause you to get completely off the path. Right. Uh, for many people, it's a process and they start eating <clears throat> fewer animal foods. Uh, and then as time goes, eat fewer and fewer until ultimately they're eating none. So I would just say take it in stride, uh, stay the course, take steps and keep going in a certain direction. I often think about, um, you know, the world is not black and white. It's usually moving from one thing to the next thing. Right. right. So just try to move it in that positive direction. And even for somebody who's vegan like myself, and I've been vegan since 1985, I'm still learning. Yeah. I'm still trying to support more local farms, for example, trying to support more organic farms. So it's a process that continues. Absolutely. And I think trying to do it too fast can actually lead to a paralyzation. Because I have a lot of people saying, I tried to go vegan once and I couldn't do it. And exactly. it, there's so much to it. I mean, I've been vegan for over 10 years. And I'm still learning. I've, you know, I've taken the courses at Cornell. I'm constantly reading new things and learning how processes are made, how our body does, how it affects the world. So when I tell people, I say, don't feel like you have to 
go all or nothing. Step into it. Work with what works for you. Like, what are some small steps that you can tell people that's listening that may not be vegan or may not even want to be vegan, but are wanting to take steps towards a plant-based lifestyle? I think the Meatless Mondays program is an excellent example of something that gets people taking steps in that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, For people who want, who, you know, it's easy to substitute too. Instead of drinking cow's milk for an app, for example, you can now get almond milk or soy milk or coconut milk mm-hmm. in mainstream stores. Instead of using meat, you can substitute other proteins. They have, you know, meatless meats now all mm-hmm. over the place. Or you can also just start adding beans and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Beans are great. Um, so just take steps and just become comfortable with the these new foods. Um, and in many cases, it's not a big shift, you know, for instance, with spaghetti and meatballs, just use vegan meatballs and those are easily available. Or you can just leave the meatballs out and maybe add veggies or add tofu or add, you know, some other protein source like that. So, um, you know, just take it in stride, you know, and uh, recognize that we are all imperfect. We are all works in progress. Even the most vegan vegan isn't perfect. Just right. walking on this planet <laughs> yeah. can right. cause some harm. That's right. just life. Right. You know? Driving your car, uh, you can hit a bug. So <laughs> that's uh-huh. right. So you know, so to me it's you know it's an aspiration to live as kindly as possible. Absolutely. You know, it's not an endpoint. So one thing we wanted to ask, I'll let Dave ask it because this was his question. I thought it was fantastic. So if if you could write a letter to yourself way back from when you when you started everything, what would you say to yourself? that's a loaded question right (laughs) you know it's really hard to say um i think one of the things i feel very good about is that farm sanctuary has evolved and has been very sort of present and dealt with circumstances as they've arisen and you know i think that we did that because that's all we knew to do and i think that that's been very a good way to go um you know, I, 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 I don't know what I would say. I, I think I would say what I would say today, basically, which is <laughs> kind of live in the moment, do the best you can. Um, I think one of the things that I probably didn't expect as much or realize was as big of a going to be as big of a challenge back in 86 is the sort of internal skirmishes within the vegan movement yeah right now, there are people that are very passionate that have very strong opinions and are sometimes not always the best listeners mm-hmm. and that can be challenging so uh so then in regards to that i've developed a variety of mantras you know one is you can't control others you can only only control yourself so you do the best you can and if somebody has a very strong a difference of opinion so be it you know, you got to understand that there are different approaches. And I also sometimes quote Ben Franklin, who said that if everybody thinks the same way, nobody's thinking. So it's actually good for there to be different perspectives. Yeah. The, the, the big issue, though, is how do those play out? Do they play out in a healthy way or an unhealthy way? And so to the extent those can play out in a healthy way that can elevate everybody's thinking, that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. So but but there's a lot of different opinions. And, and sometimes people are very passionate and, and it's hard to see other opinions. And that, that, that can be a challenge. Yeah. Absolutely. That's great advice. And I, and <laughs> I, I agree with you because sometimes I never, when I talk to people, the people who are extreme, they have their heart in the right places. They really do. And you can tell they're very passionate about what they're saying, what they're doing, and may not realize how they come off. Because um, when I, I often will say, read back aloud what you just said to me. And they're <laughs> like, oh, that sounded horrible. I can understand the message, but I think with compassion, we need to have compassion for ourselves. And when we start there, when we start with compassion for ourselves, we can have compassion for the animals and the planet. But if it's missing or it's not quite there, that's when we have trouble. And that's what Curiously Veg is doing. We we want to instill compassion for ourselves, the planet, and the animal. And... For us, obviously, everything is connected. The plant's connected to the animals. We're connected to the animals. And in turn, the plant and everything else. And And everything works together then everything everything actually has a harmony everything can, can survive and move forward and that's why Absolutely. i love books by like people your book it but well both of them it there is phenomenal and i think everyone should read it because it really gives a good perspective from the animal's point of view as well yes yes and and we really are connected mm-hmm. violence to one is violence to everybody mm-hmm. ultimately right. and those that are perpetuating the violence are you know they're in a situation that's not healthy for themselves either right Right. Yeah. yeah. Precisely. 
Um, well, and speaking with that, what uh, what would you say was the most um, uh, what's the most rewarding part of, of your your mission thus far? Well, just seeing the transformations that are happening with people as well as with animals. You know, seeing an animal come to the sanctuary who had only known cruelty, mm-hmm. who'd always experienced pain or suffering of some sort when a human approached, watching them come to trust us again and start enjoying life and then flourishing is a beautiful thing. And also seeing people who recognize that the way they're eating is causing harm to animals and the earth and themselves and that it's not in their interests and they start making changes and then people start transforming and feeling better and healthier physically and emotionally and even spiritually if if you want to go there. So it's one of those things that is a win, win, win. And so I am constantly inspired by seeing people doing good things and being empowered to live according to the best of their humanity. And that's good for everybody. Absolutely. It's like the, the it was the farm that was across from me that was a fur factory and you would open it and you, you didn't push anything on him, but he actually saw through your eyes and through the animal's eyes and actually he, he became a, a farm, right? Right, yeah, he, so we got the farm in Watkins Glen, New York and for a sanctuary for rescued farm animals. And then after we moved up there, we recognized that there was a fur farmer across the street from us who had hundreds of foxes in mm. cages, and he wow. would kill them there and skin them for fur. And so we were not happy about this. And <laughs> at first it was like, okay, what do we do? And, in, you know, so I actually reached out to him and we started inviting him to heart events at the sanctuary. Wow. And it was pretty wild to see this fur farmer there with all these vegan activists. <laughs> but, you know, but as time went, he started recognizing that uh, we had some pretty, you know, positive perspectives on things. And, and he came up to me once and said, you know what? I don't like killing the foxes. And, and what kind of vegetables do you guys like? So he, <laughs> he got out of the fox farming business and then he opened up a vegetable stand right across the street. So that was a, a very positive thing. And it's amazing the kind of change that can happen. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What, so when, you, when, you're, when you're talking with, uh, a, 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 I guess, now an ex, <laughs> ex of, a, a, a fur, fur farmer, I guess? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. For, uh, or anyone who's, um, who's who's skeptical or at least generally interested in a plant-based but skeptical, what, what's what's the probably the most difficult thing to talk about with them in your opinion? Well, I think people assume that they need to eat animal foods mm-hmm. for nutrients. You need protein from animal foods, for example, or you need to get calcium from cow's milk. Right. And those are myths. So just demonstrating that those are myths I think is very positive. Um, and I've been a vegan for over 30 years now, and in recent years I started doing marathons and triathlons, including an Ironman, to demonstrate that you know you can do everything you need, not only to survive but to thrive. So I think the health questions, and and the fear is another big obstacle. People mm-hmm. are afraid of change, and they're afraid of failing, and they're afraid of not getting enough nutrients. So just being supportive. Um, is I think one of the best things we can do and demonstrating that this lifestyle is healthy and that it's it's not about deprivation. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think sometimes it can be combative. I mean, and, and I look at it more as a process as opposed to a label where you're in or you're out. I think it's a process. And I think that is oftentimes one of the obstacles. People don't want to identify as a sure. vegan because right. What does that mean? And, <laughs> and, you know, and if you're in or you're out, it's it's not so black and white. This world we live in, mm-hmm. you know. I think from an ethical standpoint, you can make very compelling arguments that are, I think, completely truthful. That killing is killing. It's violence. It's unnecessary and it's immoral. You know, you can make that argument, <laughs> uh, but that's not necessarily a very effective way to reach people. Right. right. And so, so I think we our arguments are solid, and I think that's the underpinning of our movement. But how we communicate it and how we reach out to people, it, I th- for me, the goal is to find common ground right. and build from there. Uh, and instead of saying, we're way over here as vegans and you're way over there as meat eaters, say, look, you're meat eater, but you don't think it's okay to harm animals in certain ways, right? You know, like veal calves and crates, for example, or foie gras, some of these horrible things. Most sure. people would say, I don't like that. So there's your common ground. Mm-hmm. And then you sort of, so they care about the humane treatment of animals, 
Uh, they care about not harming the planet because animal agriculture squanders scarce resources and pollutes the earth and everything. And you start with that common ground and you build from there. And the logical conclusion is that we don't need to kill and eat other animals and we're better off. The earth is better off. The animals are better off if we don't. So, you know, you start from the common ground and build, I think, is a very effective way of creating change. That's what we've been trying to do. Here we have a cultural thing that's grounded in fried food in the South. It's very popular. One mm -hmm. of the things that we experience is there seems to be a giant cognitive dissonance between what are food animals – and then what are pets? Because raised in the South, you're, you're, you have people that will raise pigs, treat them as pets, and then eat them because they're food animals. But they get right. bent out of shape when they see, like, the Korean dog festival or the cats in China that are raised for me. And what, there's no difference between that horse meat that you're upset about, that lion meat, and pigs, chickens. And, Absolutely. Know. But it's, such a, it's, such a, it's almost such a, a wall there of going, well, those are food animals. Yeah, these are labels. It's, you know, you could even call it prejudice and discrimination. Yeah. These ones are for that, and those ones are for that. Mm -hmm. You know, and which animals we eat and which ones we see as our companions are cultural constructs. And in different countries, they eat cats and dogs, and we're appalled by that. Right. In other countries, they don't eat cows mm -hmm. or they don't eat pigs, and we do. Mm -hmm. So which ones we eat is it's really quite arbitrary. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, these are all individuals. They're living creatures who have experiences. They have memories. Uh, the more we learn about them, the more we see how complex their emotional lives are. And the more harm, un, 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 uh, upsetting it is that we're doing what we're doing. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's about paying attention. And so often there's just these, you know, these prejudices that say, well, they're there for that purpose. Therefore, I won't even think about it. And at Farm Sanctuary, we encourage people to think about it right. and then yeah. to be mindful and then to ultimately make choices that are aligned with their values and their interests. Are there, uh, with the, you know, kind of get people to bridge that gap, are there, are there any like stories or anecdotes or anything that you've kind of used to try to help kind of make someone think and kind of help, help bridge that gap? You know, I think in different circumstances, I'll talk about different things, you know, but, you know, if somebody has a companion animal, a cat or a dog, for example, uh, you know, the idea of eating them is troubling, mm -hmm. you know, because this is their friend, not their food. Um, and for Thanksgiving, you know, at Farm Sanctuary, we have an annual event. It's a celebration for the turkeys where we have a big feast and the turkeys are the guest of honor not the main course, and we feed them instead of eating them. And this is a way to turn the tables. And sometimes when I'm speaking to people about that, um, I talk about how we started this new celebration because for vegetarians and vegans and people that care about all animals, Thanksgiving is a pretty difficult holiday where you have everybody celebrating around the body of a dead bird in the middle of the table. And I will sometimes say, well, now, what if that was your dog in the middle of the mm -hmm. table? How would you feel? And that's how it feels to us who know turkeys as our friends. Right. So it's, you know, th these are animals just like our cats and dogs, and they want to live just like our cats and dogs, and just like we do. Mm -hmm. And being kind to them is, is good for us as well. I think that's shown in the prison system where they've put rescue dogs in with not, well, they have some in violent, but not so violent offenders it changes those people so much yes. and you can see you can see something click when they're working with these animals that have because a lot of them go these these animals are just like us they've been abandoned they've been abused they've been discarded yes. and this companionship that melds and i think that's what we're lacking is we're so distant from the animals we used to live with them you know my, my great grandparents had animals they had chickens in their yards and there's animals everywhere now there's nothing here but pavements and shops and we don't have that companionship anymore absolutely well, there's studies that have shown that when people and animals have positive interactions it lowers stress for us as well as animals it lowers our blood pressure it improves our health I actually talk about that in the book living the farm sanctuary life mm -hmm. so you know this type of positive relationship is a win-win um, you know we're not trying to put anybody down and that is another of the issues I think that is an obstacle. Sometimes people, when vegans come up to them and start talking about not eating animals and how killing unnecessarily is unethical and all those things, people feel defensive. 
that they're being mm-hmm. attacked. Um, and so I think it's important for us to, to say, look, we're not trying to attack anybody. We're not trying to put anybody down. We're trying to bring everybody up, you know, and, you know, I care about people as well as animals. I don't like anybody to suffer unnecessarily. I don't like violence or abuse or cruelty. Uh, and most people don't like violence or abuse <laughs> or cruelty, you know, so this is, again, a common ground. Um, but then there are norms, you know, where eating animals is the norm. And then there are beliefs and prejudices well they're there for that purpose right well who said they were there for that purpose <laughs> you know and you know over the course of human history there have been a number of situations where they're there for that purpose has been the excuse for doing some very bad things mm-hmm. and right. as time goes though and as we evolve um, we start recognizing that well maybe they are not there for our use uh, maybe they are here as companions on this planet it's kind of like the shift that happened when, you know, Galileo and people like that were saying the Earth is not the center of the solar system, you know, right. or the universe. Right. We're saying, you know, humans are not the center of everything and we're not the pinnacle of everything. We're part of it. Right. Absolutely. And, and that's actually a much more, I think, enriching perspective mm-hmm. for ourselves as well. And it's funny because if you look at science fiction, especially Gene Roddenberry, the future yeah. was in not eating animals. And yes. it was seen as barbaric and ridiculous. So you see, and, and you know, science fiction becomes science fact. So that's yeah. kind of hopeful. But mm-hmm. to see that when these kind of uh, the future is in making ourselves better, but also not relying on this and, and evolving. And I think we are evolving. And by the way, congratulations, because I heard you were in Compassionate Man. Is it Compassionate Man? It's a GQ of yeah, vegan? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's sort of like the GQ of vegan. <laughs> I know. I was, I was like, well, this is a good example. What do you think about this as showing that we are evolving and this kind of magazine is, is out? That's great. Yes, I think that's right. You know, it, it shows that being vegan is... Masculine? Is, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Compassionate. It's cool. It's, it's healthy. Um, it's... It, it it's it's aspirational yeah. you know it's not something that is about uh giving things up and living under a rock or sort of out in the middle of nowhere it's you know we can live in the middle of nowhere we can be in nature but we right. can also be in the city um mm-hmm. and vegan food is becoming much more available it's mm-hmm. in amazing restaurants now the vegan cuisine is taking off um so i think our movement is developing and evolving and and more and more people recognize that it's it's good for them. Right. So I, I'm very optimistic about the things that are happening right now. Because if we're going to explore space, we're going to have to have a vegan diet there because you're not going to be able to take your cows and chickens up there. So uh, I guess the Martian was <laughs> kind of oh, my point. Yeah. So. That's, that, that's what the NASA is doing. NASA, they're, they're, they're developing how to grow plants in space because you can't take animal products with you to other planets and mm-hmm. grow them in you, you you can grow you can grow plants on mars but you can't raise a chicken on mars wouldn't yeah, well grow. animal agriculture is inherently inefficient right so Absolutely. in addition to sort of the voluntarily you know the voluntary moves towards eating plants because it makes sense and it's healthier and, and so on i think there's going to be some we're not going to have a choice at a certain point because right. as the human population grows there's only so much acreage that'll only support you know, a certain amount of people. And right. if we're growing animal foods, we can feed far fewer than if we're growing plant foods. Right. So there's going to be, I think, some ecological uh, constraints on how much meat we are able to eat in the future. And but but from the ethical standpoint, there's also a growing recognition that, you know, these are living creatures. They have very complex lives and killing them comes with some real ethical questions and problems Absolutely. and you know it's not only science fiction writers although that's great they do it but you even have people like a uh, charles krauthammer who's like a conservative pundit on like these sunday morning news programs and he was asked by politico that often asks these different journalists and politicians different questions and one of the questions is in a hundred years we'll look back on today and be baffled by what and he said we'll be baffled by the fact that we're eating animals. Wow, and, that's awesome. And years. So, so there's this real recognition that it's something that is not really the very becoming of us mm-hmm. from an ethical standpoint. And if we can live well without killing other animals, you know, it, it becomes pretty obvious the direction we should go, I think. Right. Well, you have people like, you have uh, like uh, Richard uh, Richard Dawkins, who's an evolutionary biologist, who even he says that it's, it's important that we do. We know that we know animals feel pain. 
We know they feel fear. We know that uh, like cow, cows and pigs, they have the mentality, the cognitive mentality of a three to four year old. And the fact yes. that we eat them is is ridiculous. And he and he admits that he's hypocritical in doing so. And there are a lot of people that feel that way too, and uh, feel unhappy about that dissonance. Mm-hmm. And this is where more and more vegan food becoming more widely available, I think, is one of the reasons we're seeing such a shift, because there is that dissonance that is much more present in people's minds. Mm-hmm. And if there is a vegan option, they're going to tend to gravitate towards that, I think, more so as time goes. And the more of these vegan options that are available, the better. And they're becoming so widely available now. It's in 1985, when I went vegan <laughs> for soy milk, you had to like get this milk with soy in the morning, mix it with water. It was, you know, <laughs> and now you go to most mainstream grocery stores, and there's all kinds of different vegan milks, and there's even vegan cheeses now. Mm-hmm. There's you know meatless meats, but there's also high-end chefs that are taking different vegetables and beans and creating amazing food out of plants. And so this is a evolving art form in a sense almost and and people are recognizing that it can be very satisfying it can be incredible and tasty and so there's some so this is another thing that's happening i think just in recent years along with things like the compassionate man magazine which is like the gq there's all this stuff happening uh that only serves to further our mission i think so this is a hot topic with manhound what do you think about lab created meat (laughs) <laughs> I personally wouldn't eat it. Um, I think it's opening a doorway. Like I have four cats that are ablative carnivores. I think that is a for animals that need that we are caretakers of. Yes. Humans, I honestly think it's better if they're going to do that than to go kill an animal. He doesn't like it at all. What are you, What is your thoughts on the lab created meat? <laughs> <laughs> Would you try it? I'm guessing no. <laughs> so. Well, I have um, mixed feelings about it. I was actually at a thing once, and somebody was passing out a plate of that stuff. And I I did not reach for a bit and eat it. So personally, it's not something that I'm excited about consuming. Um, I think that there's all kinds of great things in the plant kingdom Mm -hmm. that would be my first choice. Right. And there are also companies like Beyond Meat that are Mm -hmm. on the market now where you got plant based proteins that are made to look like meat and are replacing meat in various dishes. So that I think is great. Um, I think that, you know, these in vitro meats could play a role at you know reducing meat consumption so you know from a purely utilitarian standpoint if people are going to do that instead of cutting the throat of an animal Mm -hmm. it's a step in the right direction and i tend to be an incrementalist and try to speak to people where they are on their own journeys Um, but i also feel that we're making enormous progress now and this idea of not eating any animal flesh at all is becoming much more acceptable to Mm -hmm. the mainstream so whether this in vitro meat product becomes very widely uh, distributed or necessary is a question in my mind. Uh, I think in the case of obligate carnivores like cats, it could play a role. Um, but I think for human beings, I think that we're actually well suited to not eat that and that we're best suited, in fact, to eat more plant foods, very mm-hmm. fibrous foods. If you look at our biology, you know, we're not made to tear into the flesh of another animal. No, not and if we see an animal who is injured or bleeding and, and dying or dead, we don't tend to salivate, yep. which is what a carnivore would do. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also have a very long intestinal tract, whereas meat eaters have a very short intestinal tract mm-hmm. because meat is a putrefying piece of flesh and it has to get through your body quickly. Mm-hmm. And if it goes into a human being with a very long intestinal tract, it can take days for this putrefying piece of meat to get through and that doesn't look very pretty after a few days at a 98.6 degree moist environment you know and then you get delicious so so i mean i think this in vitro meat you know an animal's throat is not being cut Mm -hmm. and but the product itself has no fiber in its flesh and it's i don't know so that's that's my opinion but again from a utilitarian standpoint it will reduce suffering and that's a good thing Mm -hmm. so my feelings are mixed it's kind of like the, it, it, everybody has their own journey, and every but we know that we're ideally made to eat plants because you don't really have a protein deficiency. We have a fiber deficiency. That's the biggest yes. issue that we're having. But not I, I do know people that they when you say something is a vegan meat, they're all like no. But if you say and I and, and I ask them, well, what about 
lab created me. They go, I'll try that. That sounds good. I'm like, okay, well, if that's their mentality at this point in time, I'm not going to argue with them because if that takes the cruelty and also helps our planet, let's go for it. I don't want it. I just, I, for some reason, even making it in the lab, lab created me sounds even worse. (laughs) Frank and me. Yeah. I have a feeling that I'd grow another head in my stomach. I don't, I don't know. It just, it just, I, I've seen enough, I've seen enough bad B horror movies to make me, I I grew up in the eighties. The visual just got me. (laughs) <laughs> like praying from the t- <laughs> yeah. but yeah, I mean, weird, you know? <laughs> but you know, we have impossible meats that have made it's, it, they've made one that that's all plants and it tastes and looks and bleeds just like it, and that's also been appealing to meat eaters. So we have a lot of options. I think that we're heading in the right direction. It just depends on what path you want to go on, and as I long as you're not should. killing anything for selfish gains, I think. Go as long it. as we can create mutually beneficial relationships, you know, to right. me that's what it boils down to. And when you take another animal and kill them, that's mm-hmm. not really mutually beneficial. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> and I think that's what's important for what you do at the farm sanctuary is you're creating, you've created these environments, and I, I can't wait. I think that these are going to go more and more. I'd like to see them in every state. So you can go there and see how much we need the animals as much as they need us. We, we, are, a, we, are, we, we need each other. We're companions. We're meant to exist on this planet together. Bringing yes. that back and letting people go there and, and interact with these animals, that will change the minds more than preaching and screaming and throwing all the scientific study. That, that really turns people off. But when you sit there, you sit down and you, you meet this animal and it's not in a package, that can change your perspective completely. Yes. And I think human beings are essentially emotional animals. Yes. And we like to talk about being the rational animal. But I think it's more accurate to say we're the rationalizing animal, yeah. and we have to rationalize a lot when we don't feel very good about what we're doing. Mm-hmm. So, so over the course of our history, we've done a lot of terrible things, but we have usually come up with good reasons to do it, why we had to do it, why we didn't have a choice. Yeah. In the case of animals, well, we don't have a choice. We need to eat them for protein or whatever, and mm-hmm. so you know, it's, it's a necessary evil. But when it's no longer a necessary evil, mm-hmm. then it becomes just kind of an evil. Yeah. <laughs> if we don't need to kill, we don't need to kill. Um, but at Farm Sanctuary, the animals get to enjoy their lives. We get to enjoy their lives. They get to enjoy ours. We get mm-hmm. to enjoy ours. It's a win-win. It's a place of healing. Mm-hmm. It's a place where nobody has to be afraid of somebody coming after them with a hatchet, mm-hmm. you know, which is the case at a slaughterhouse. Right. And, um, and it's just modeling a different kind of relationship. And I sometimes think about uh, how back in the – during the Salem witch hunts, Mm -hmm. Uh, The executioners who were charged with killing these witches Mm -hmm. were told not to look into their eyes because if they looked into their eyes, they would cast a spell and you would not be able to kill them. Mm -hmm. And so at Farm Sanctuary, you have a chance to look into the animal's eyes to connect with them, Mm -hmm. to see that there's somebody there. They are somebody, not something. Mm -hmm. And that is enriching for ourselves as well. And that's the beauty of what happens at at Farm Sanctuary. And just when we connect with others, whether they're humans or other animals, that Mm -hmm. we're all on this planet together, we all share this planet, we share the air, we share our lives essentially with others. And to do it in a way that is mutually beneficial is a beautiful thing. Uh, And you contrast that with what happens at factory farms and slaughterhouses. And I think most people, it's a slam dunk what they would choose. They would mm-hmm. rather not be in the slaughterhouse unless there's something, you know, really troubling or problematic, which that happens. I mean, there's there's illnesses in the world, but most people are going to choose the kindness, are going to choose the peace instead of the violence and the cruelty. That's and that's, and, and that's a, that gives me hope. People, you know, would rather live according to their humanity and mm-hmm. live in a way that beautiful instead of that is ugly and harmful that's very powerful uh, and i love that and it is when you look in somebody's eyes or you look in an animal's eyes it changes you there's there's an experiment of sitting down with your friend or your partner and not saying anything and looking in each other's eyes can often reveal a lot about not only you but that person same with the animals animals will look you in the eyes and to show love and when you do that, and you know, it's easier to kill something you're not connected to, but if you look at that and you see that spark, you see that soul or whatever creates that life, it's going to be harder for you to look at it as a thing. And this happens also between human and human violence. Yes. You know, there's that classic story, I think it was during World War I, where you had on one side of the line were the Germans, on the other side were the English, mm-hmm. and it was Christmas Eve. Mm-hmm. 
and the Germans started singing Silent Night in German. Mm -hmm. And then the English heard them singing this, and they started singing it in English. And that Christmas Eve, they had this sort of peaceful, you know, shared meal together. And then the next day, they had to go back to killing each other. And a lot of the soldiers didn't want to do that. So their superiors had to initiate new rules like no cavorting with the enemy kind of stuff. Yeah. So when you connect with somebody else, you don't want to kill them, you know? And and I think when you are disconnected, then the killing becomes more acceptable and routine. Justified. And, and, it's justified. And, and, and we don't think about what we're doing. So it's about paying attention and, and doing things that we can feel good about that are aligned with our values and interests is, is really kind of the, the bottom line, I think. Excellent. I've got, got our cables all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and in, re, in regards to kind of kind of what, as far as moving on into kind of moving our movement forward, um, what, do, what, do you, what do you see as like the next steps that we can kind of start moving forward or or kind of getting getting the kind of inspiring others? Well, you know, I'm really very much a grassroots kind of guy. And I believe that a big part of the change is going to happen in communities all over the country where there are people that are having vegan potlucks or these vegan dining clubs. They go out together to a restaurant and encourage the restaurant to have vegan food that day. And even if it's a non-vegan restaurant, that now encourages the restaurant to try plant-based food. They maybe learn through the process. They maybe come up with a dish that is popular and maybe it goes on the menu. Mm -hmm. So I think that the marketplace and grassroots activity is, is critical. I think there's an entrepreneurial spirit also among the animal rights and vegan communities where people are coming up with um, new products, you know, vegan products. I think the farming world is interesting too. There's We're in the midst of a food movement where you have farmers markets popping up community supported agriculture programs. And I think some of those farmers are now recognizing the market for plant-based foods and the demand is growing. And so I think there's going to be more farmers also that are coming in, in place to meet those demands. So I think the grassroots and I, and, and I also tend to be very community oriented. So local, this is where farmers markets, CSAs, local restaurants, local community, I think is very important, mm -hmm. and that tends to filter up. You know, the politicians generally don't lead. They <laughs> yeah. often, you know, As bring their pal, yeah. they, they bring their pal, the constituent, you know, and say, "My friend Joe did this," you know, and <laughs> but it was the, the the guy on the ground, right, that made something happen, you know. Right. So that's you know, I right. think where the change is going to continue happening, and and we vote with our dollars. Right. So as consumers. Absolutely. We have more power with how we spend our dollars, I think, than how we cast our votes. It's important to vote for our elected officials, right. but every day we're spending dollars, or most days. And mm -hmm. so the way we spend those has a big impact collectively. And as we, we make more conscientious choices, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to shift. And it's starting to shift things, I think. Right. And it's what we, it's what we do and not so much what we say. So voting yes. with our dollar, what we wear, what we read, what we put, what we put our energy into is what's going to flourish. Yes. And I think that's what we, because we, we pick curiously veg because I didn't want to do anything vegan, but we'll, we'll ask people, are you curiously veg? And they're like, what is that? Well, it's a movement for you to ask yourself, are you curious about being healthy? Are you curious about the planet, the animals? Are you curiously veg? Yes. And curiosity we, is a good Yeah. So we use curiosity and question, not trying to, to push anything, but bring people in like you to talk about what you do and how important it is and then ask the question are you curiously veg do you want to know more do you want to know how you can change even if it's little things you don't have to do anything major it's as little as exactly. meatless mondays i love meatless mondays yes yeah. yes and and oftentimes when i'm speaking with people and you know sometimes these issues can be contentious mm -hmm. you know if, if they know i'm a vegan they may feel like they're being judged um and Sometimes asking questions is mm -hmm. a really good way to create a positive discussion instead of making statements and saying killing animals is cruel and unnecessary. You know, making a declarative statement like that will sometimes put a person in a corner. But if you ask a question about like, you know, have you been to a slaughterhouse? Mm -hmm. Have you thought of what it would be like to work in a slaughterhouse? then that gets a person thinking and paying attention to the reality of that. 
whereas if you make a declarative statement, it can sometimes put up a wall mm -hmm. and close a person's mind to thinking about it and paying attention to it. And then there becomes this defensiveness and then not a lot of good comes from that, I don't think. So asking questions and and tapping into curiosity, I think that's another human quality is that mm -hmm. we are curious and we wonder about things. And most people also, I think, want to be kind and do good things on the planet right. instead of destroy the planet. So, <laughs> you know, how can you do good things on the planet? You know, are you curious about that? And are you curious about some of your daily choices and the impacts they have on the planet? And do they have positive ones or negative ones? And if you can make positive choices, would you? All right. Most people would say, hell yeah. And then you say, well, here's how you do it, you know? Because somebody wants to be told that you're wrong or you're bad. Yeah. That's but right. people are open to go, do you know, or what What would you think? And I think that's that's a beautiful thing about Farm Sanctuary is you're not telling anybody, you're not pushing anything, you're just saying, that, come and ask yourself these questions about these animals. And that's what I love about your books is, is it's not, I don't see anything in there that's harsh. You're just saying, look, this is what we see. This is what I experience. This is what we feel. These are the animals. So ask yourself. If, exactly. the, if, the, if the animals had something to say, what would they say? That's exactly. a good question because they, we can't understand their voices, but we can understand their feelings. So commit, going to Varm Sanctuary and getting those feelings and say, what what would they say to me? You can understand that. And I thank you for doing this. I mean, it's exciting to see that you're growing and I can't and, and John Stewart coming on board and, you know, opening a sanctuary. We're seeing some big changes here and I'm excited very, about it. It's a very, very exciting time, you know, and uh, no, we're opening up a sanctuary with John and Tracy Stewart in New Jersey. And so that's a very uh, you know, project that I'm very, very happy about, and it's going to have big impacts. And you know, people are thinking, you know, mm -hmm. paying attention. And somebody like John Stewart can really help people pay attention. You know, and I was on his show uh, last year. It, mm -hmm. it really had a lot of people got a hold of us as a result of that because they were now interested. And and John has just such a a wonderful voice and a credibility mm -hmm. that is so often lacking in our country, you know, when you're talking about public figures. <laughs> right. And um, so we're very, you know, very happy about that whole thing. And um, But there's a lot of good stuff happening. A yep. lot of people are doing really good things. We have one here that just opened up. It's a very small farm. Uh, it's a rescue sanctuary now called New, A New Hope. We went there, we interviewed them, and we down to where they had a, was a possum that was blind that just walked in circles. I said, I'll put it down. They have rehabilitated this animal, and they're very small, wow. and they're trying to grow. They've got, you know, they're out in Rome, but um, we're seeing these smaller ones pop up, and I'm hoping that these can connect with you or other people that are wanting to bridge this, and we can have this here. And it's, it is exciting, and you yeah. know, I, I thank you for what you do. It, you know, it's, it's very important the work that you're doing, and, and the voice that you have is very important. And I want to thank you for coming on Curiously Veg to talk about this. So maybe we can yeah. get little people maybe ask themselves, what would the animals say? Should I go yeah. and talk to them? Right. And, and and how do I feel when I eat them? You know, I mean, how do I feel about them? You, know? <laughs> you know, so it's about the animal and it's also about ourselves, you know, and what that relationship looks like. But yeah, connecting with animals can be very life changing and, and that happens at the sanctuary. I feel very lucky to do that this work. Um, I think our movement is growing, the momentum is building. I, I love your approach to this as well, you know, encouraging people to be curious and to ask questions and ultimately to pay attention and think about it Absolutely. and then to make choices, hopefully, that are compassionate and aligned with compassionate values and aligned with their well-being and their interests and the interests of the planet and other animals. It's It really is kind of a slam dunk when you think about it. But yeah. Got to think about it. Right. It just seems so. <laughs> when you start thinking about it, it seems so obvious. And that's I just. And again, it just get people. Someone asks me, well, if you don't eat, if you don't eat, where do you get your omega threes? And I go, well, walnuts, flax seeds, hemp seeds. And like then when you just start realizing there's other alternatives, I'm like, oh, okay. And I, I was talking to a cousin of mine recently, and uh, she was same thing. She just asked me questions over questions over questions, and realizing that oh, one, when you know what you're talking about and you can present the information. And realizing, okay, you know what you're talking about. This isn't just a, it isn't just a, a, a guess. And you're providing prop, properly formed information. You can get someone to kind of start thinking and moving over. So true. So true. And we grow up with certain beliefs and bombarded with certain messages that aren't necessarily accurate. You know, again, this idea that we need to eat meat for protein is a complete myth. But we're bombarded with that idea growing up. And now you have these 
high level athletes performing extremely well on vegan diets. You know, people like Carl Lewis did his best times, the, the Olympic athlete did his best times on a vegan diet. You know, this is something people don't hear, but it's it's real and it shows that this is a, a, a way of eating that allows us to thrive. Um, and the idea that we need to drink cow's milk for calcium is another myth that is commonly believed because we're bombarded by million dollar advertising campaigns. But in our country, we drink a lot of cow's milk and we also get a lot of osteoporosis. Yeah. So if drinking cow's milk gave us the calcium to prevent osteoporosis, we shouldn't see it, but we do. So, you know, when you just start paying attention and recognizing that this is a viable option to eat plants instead of animals, we can get all the nutrients we need, then it becomes our choice. And then hopefully, you know, people can make conscientious choices. Uh, but we're emotional animals, and so we need support. And right. if everybody's doing things a certain way and you start doing them a different way, that is challenging. Yes. And that's why I think it's so important for vegans to be very supportive and encouraging of any step Absolutely. in a more positive direction. Because small steps tend to add up, and they can lead to big changes over time. That's a great ending for this. So <laughs> that, is a, that is a good <laughs> statement into it. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. We Absolutely. were very excited about this, and um, hopefully Absolutely. you'll come on again and sure, talk with I'd us. Sure, I'd be happy to. And, and uh, if, if, uh, if someone wanted to uh, reach out to Farm Sanctuary, uh, whether volunteer or um, uh, donate, do you need donations to help you out? Where, where, where can they do that, and what's the best way? You can go to our website, which is farmsanctuary.org. There's information there about supporting the organization, about interning. We actually have interns that come and live on the farm and help take care of the animals. Um, people can get my book, uh, Living the Farm Sanctuary Life, which has a lot of great vegan recipes as well as information. Um, so those are some of the sources. But yeah, check out our website, farmsanctuary.org, and uh, get involved. Excellent. And we'll make sure to put links in for you tons and a link and to buy links. your book. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a great read, honestly. I've, I've really enjoyed it. I, I, actually put, I was walking around with it yesterday. I ran into a wall. I got so engrossed in it. And I, was, <laughs> I was texting him going, oh, it's a great statement with this. We've got to ask him this. So, yeah, it, it, it is. Notes. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. But, but it's an approachable book, I think, for everybody. That I don't, it's not an overwhelming book, but it does ask questions. It does, Well, it makes you ask questions once you read it, and I really i have enjoyed it. So thank you, and thank you for coming on board, and thank you for what you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, too. We'll, Absolutely. we'll keep doing it. <laughs> we'll keep, well, we'll <laughs> keep doing it. And uh, just you know, keep asking questions. Are you curiously veg? So, yes. You know? right. so, cool. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good talking to you. All right, guys. Welcome back. Thank you for staying around after the interview and uh, kind of sitting with us and listening to how we, how we felt about it and some of our thoughts about what, uh, what uh, Gene touched on. I, uh, I think we actually talked to him a little bit after, you know, to kind of talk about our ideas and where he's going. We were uh, giddy. We were giddy. We had him on a lot longer than I think he intended. He was, uh, he was so nice. I think, I think that he would have kept talking to us, but I, I, I try to be mindful because I want to bring him back on. Absolutely. To talk about, you know, to, to bridge some gaps with, you know, the topics we touched on and, and to continue talking about the work that he's doing because right. it is very important. So. Well, we, we talked with him a little bit after about doing some uh, some further work with him uh, mm -hmm. locally and, and things like that. So hopefully we can make, we can bring that to uh, to fruition and, uh, and uh, uh, kind of have, have him at least, at least you know, in locally here and have some people uh, involved in meeting him and hear him, hear him speak. Well, we uh, need to go visit our turkey. That is true. I'd we love to go to the farm yeah. and visit our turkey that Absolutely. we adopted. So. And, uh, and, and yeah, we do we do a uh, vote every year. So this year we're gonna do another vote to who who who, who we should uh, rescue this year. So. Yeah. Um, one thing I was highly impressed with was I mean there's 30 years, of, right? of, uh, of of the farm sanctuary life for him. It's it's fantastic. And even here and, and how it all started with him you know, with like the sheep or the lambs and, and mm -hmm. a pile of. Like, God, it's hard. It's hard to listen to. Yeah, well, most people don't realize that. I mean, you and I know because right. we look into the practices because this is our job. But I think for and the everyday person that isn't researching this and doesn't, it, it kind of has the idea of oh, well, I see free range, so the animals are happy and they're out here. They don't realize the darker side to it. That that's kind of the illusion that these places want you to have but right. they don't realize what happens to these animals and what they go through what's well, it's it's, and it's about the illusion <clears throat> in the illusion first of you have multiple illusions one people think well you know they see you know the uh, the hidden camera videos and stuff like that and like well that's rare that never happens that's that's that instance i'm like no that's, that's the problem is that's commonplace 
and just it's so hidden from you, you don't realize how commonplace that is. It's so commonplace that they passed the law to protect these places, right, the, the ag law, law, right? To where uh, it, it what floors me is even if someone catches an organization doing something that's completely illegal and immoral. Right. They're still going to go to jail for, for bringing that to light. I think that's abs- that's just absurd. I well, don't get it. You have that, and you have you know like, well, I only do cage free, or, or you know, free range. You don't do cage free or free range. Like cage free, free range is like is is barely a foot, foot and a half per animal. They're just not in cages. They're, right. They're, they're locked in a small building. Right. Yeah. And I, I I don't know if you've seen the photos and videos. Basically, they just they just um, roll foam through the entire and building suffocate and suffocate them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because it's effective to get rid of animals. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's and again, I, I, I'm not going to get you know gory on the show. That's one thing that we try not to do really yeah. is get too too you know too too graphic. But it's you know it's 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 all marketing. Even mm-hmm. you know people like well I only do like grass fed anything grass fed whatever. It's like okay, enough people enough people seeing that and it's marketed as better for the environment, but it requires more land per individual animal to be considered grass fed from a USDA standpoint. Mm-hmm. And even then, to have that, they have to clear cut and they have to remove trees, and that pushes out um, other animals and birds and foxes and wolves into other farmland, in which now the state comes in or county comes in and traps them, and then it creates an imbalance them. for the predator prey. Absolutely. And it also changes the way that our our land flows, rivers, because we've seen that in, in uh, Yellowstone when they put the wolves back, and that was you know that that was that was pretty eye opening to realize that we have a symbiotic relationship with these animals. We're not meant to have they're they're not meant for us. Right. They're meant to be with us. There's even, a difference. Even in the same vein, talking about Yellowstone, they have the uh, buffalo like, hunt every year. That just started like that. today. Have you? I I've, I'm, I've, I've, it's not to get graphic, but I've already seen the pictures and it, this morning because it just it, and and it, well, it broke my heart. The reason is 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 the the we forced them out of their basically the way we, we, way we forced them to migrate. They end up on rancher lands mm-hmm. and then that's why yeah because they're encroaching on private property into rancher lands and that's why but you know understand we're, we're the reason they're getting pushed there so instead of working to find ways okay this time of year the buffalo come this way at least herding them around at least at least at least guiding them again i don't have all the studies in front of me i'm not saying no solution to things like this but just saying okay well they're in the way let's just not kill them off doesn't to me is a uh is a is a is a extremely <laughs> aggressive way of handling a problem. Well, Cowspiracy talks Quotes. about this. Yeah. We, you know, we talk. He Gene had seen Cowspiracy too, and it it's uh, it touches on a lot of what we're talking about, and it kind of sheds light on how things are, how, how even protection agencies are so scared of right. losing funding or getting in trouble. We see that in Cowspiracy when they were talking to them, and they would like, well, this conversation's over, they'll change the subject yeah. like that. And a trigger warning there, especially on the extended version on Netflix, yeah. there are some graphic parts right, to it. So if you're if you're very sensitive to things like that, you might just want to know right. that there's. So if it gets to the duck farm, you might yeah. want to fast forward through that. I just I just think I'm just impressed with this tenacity of keep it 30 years. Farm sanctuary, open. I know I said college word. <laughs> <laughs> three three farms, three farm sanctuaries. Yep. One in New York, two in California. Yep. Uh, I think we need to we need to hop a plane one day, go up there and visit our turkey and visit all of them there. I don't want to leave though. I'll be just laying in the middle of the field going, I want to lay with You'll all the cows. Be like Ace Ventura. <laughs> go to be my jungle friend. Lord, they're come running out. But even but, how long he's been vegan? Because I've been vegan for just a little over well over a decade now, mm-hmm. well over a decade now, but. When I started, uh, actually when I started vegetarianism in the early, uh, about t- around 2000, it was difficult to find things. Right. And now it seems so, it's almost utopian because you can go, even <laughs> if you just have Walmart, Walmart has a huge selection of vegan food. Yeah, it used to be like, Target's you know, <laughs> getting a lot of things. So. Yeah, you, you, and we talked a bit about how uh, larger companies buying up yeah. know, vegan products are, are coming out with their own. You have like Hellman's who... After they, <laughs> after, after they, after just, they try to take out, yeah, take take out. Um, was it um, just mayo? Just mayo, and the, the the that didn't fall. That that fell through. So then mm-hmm. they came out with their own. Which knowing how long it takes to do product production and marketing and labeling, I'm like, dude, there had to have been some something going behind the scenes before even the lawsuit happened. Again, I don't know. I'm speculating. So what I find that interesting is like, is it are you trying to remove your competition then, or? But, well, um, he says he made a good point. It opens up for new small. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it's good. Like my my mother my mother in law they live in Greenwood, and she's cutting out dairy. And this has made it easier for her because she can go to Walmart because Greenwood doesn't really have much. I think right. they they have they have a Publix now, um, which does have some vegan. Um, items but she they have the main thing is walmart but she's able to go get silk like you're saying silk's owned by a larger company True. but um if, if and you know it 
may not be a perfect food or a perfect thing, but it's getting her healthier, and it's more available for her there. Well, the benefit, and we talked about this just a second ago, was about is, is having the options. Yep. You know, and again, when I have you years ago, you didn't have the options. Like he said, you soy your soy milk was basically a powdered baby <laughs> milk pot that you mix with water, and now we have so many options. You can walk into a cheese aisle and just have just you know so like well no like I don't like this and like that and I hear people all the time like well I tried going vegan going vegan going vegan but vegan but I liked or like I tried day I didn't like it so I didn't like well now there's more options you know and you know like there's cheeses that we try that are like just I can't do it and there are ones that we absolutely love that someone else may not like yeah, it's so like it's, the cheese we had on our lasagna last night precisely not, not so well good. not so much so um, that's only because we like day and day without so we, <laughs> we have, well, so we have there's we, day there's there's you know and then there's the uh, the uh, pure abundance sheet. Right. which is what we were trying to look for because I, I i know that uh, if you go to our site um they they're carried in whole foods right um a lot of the restaurants around here a lot of them, like the the wrecking bar pub i think is the, the name of I it i believe so yeah i didn't actually think a pub would carry vegan food and it's the market and yeah you, if you go to uh, uh pureabundancefoods.com food oh sorry pureabundancefood.com thank mm-hmm. you for reading um, you can actually use a locator and see where it's in your area. And if it's not in your area, for example, maybe somewhere else in this, we're, we're in Georgia, so if in this located, it's an Atlanta-based company. So if you're outside of Georgia or anything like that, uh, you can you can put, place an order through the website, either through a contact form or a shop area. I know she's about to launch a new site she's, as well. Yeah, she's got. Well, her site, her new site is launched. Um, it's available on Instacart for Whole Foods, and she's part partners up. Let me look. See, let me pull it up. Probably for um, notes, are covering your hand to make it easier. I know, <laughs> I know, but you know, I'm I'm a, but, uh, I'm a stickler for writing yeah. things out. That's so, just that's just the way I am, you little millennial. Eh. Um, but she she's they they're working on getting it in, getting it out. It's called it Nature's Garden Express, which is home or office in Metro Atlanta and beyond. So I'm guessing that she's working hard to get these sheets out because they're, they're really, really good. Oh, they're fantastic. And she's, and I, I, I and she's always, so amazing. I, I always tell, I tell her by her hair. I'm like, I, we'll, we'll go to Veg Fest. I'm like, there it is. <laughs> I love her hair. It's fantastic. I know, I know you get a little little, little jealous of uh, of the style she yeah. gets going. But, well, you uh, know how she became vegan, right? No, what's her story? She, she found a dog that was running running loose when she was driving home. And, Classic. Oh, what's right. the dog's name? Abra. Abra? Is that name? Yeah. Is it Abra or is it Cadabra? Because that's. Well, she needs. Well, it's Abra, so she needs a Cadabra. Exactly. Um, but that made her when she she brought the dog home became like the dog mama because we're I'm the kitty mama. Right. Um, I think that made her change her mind and it really it really opens your when you sh- when you share a connection. This is what we talked about with Jean as well. Precisely. Exactly. When you share a connection with an with an uh, I'm I'm not saying animal a companion like that it it changes how you look at things. And that really struck with her about, you know, I need to make a difference. And she did. I mean, her quote on here is, <clears throat> there's no conflict between pleasing the palate and promoting peace when we get to do both. And I, I truly think, I mean, talking with Allison, she really is a caring person and her company reflects that. And that's one of the reasons why we, you know, are very interested in having her as a sponsor because right. not only is the product really good but what she does and what she promotes is just she's just uh, amazing yeah and for, and for those who are new to uh, the, uh, a vegan cheese um and i use the quote vegan because a cheese it's it's it's, it's cheese it's, it's real cheese. cheese it's cheese um it cheese is, is any is any cultured product that, mm-hmm. that that acts as a that acts as as a cheese type thing so like the, you know this you can melt it put it on crackers you put it on, make you can make goat cheese sandwiches it's not out of it stretchy melty but it's, right. it's, it's more of the it's art, creamy it's the it's the artesian creamy kind of cheese right and it's and, 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 I mean you go to the you, know, you go to the website and I, I, I need some of this now you go you go to the website you see she has little she has examples and like and images and recipes and stuff that uh, you can use the cheeses for and salads and mm-hmm. on sandwiches and I want to go to sandwich right now um, yeah we're gonna have to drive out to a different because I told <laughs> I told Massa because we didn't get to we couldn't find it at our Whole Foods we're gonna go grab some more because we're we're out of cheese altogether so we're just gonna go grab some yeah. tonight. And, I might but, make a um, mac and cheese with the uh, pan cheese tonight. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and if you need, of course, and also if you need other staples, if you if you're new to this, uh, if Jean has inspired you, or maybe we've inspired you to kind of get a little healthier, include plant based. It's easier than ever to find healthy food Absolutely. because of Thrive Market Thrive going Market. through there. Um, I know like you use Amazon, we've used Thrive Market, and I I, I do green smoothies every morning and. I uh, I've went in there and compared prices to kind of get bulk because it, it run, when you do smoothies every morning that hemp seed and chia seeds all that runs mm-hmm. out really quick, um, and the prices were much better than going through Amazon and things like that. Well, not only that, they carry products because the shampoos and 
vitamins that we use, right. they're much cheaper. Right. And we get it delivered right to our door. Cause it, it's not only good for places that don't have access to uh, stores that might have a variety of it, but anybody who's busy, because I know like you, you're, I don't think you sleep. So being able to <laughs> well have, between what we got going on, I don't think I can. <laughs> right. So you know when when you have a busy schedule to have that just delivered to your door, that cuts down on how much footwork you have to do. And you can go to it, we it's thrivemarket.com backslash curiously veg. No, uh, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe us. Yeah, if you go to thrivemarket.com, we also have a um, yeah thrivemarket.com because they're yeah. So if you go to um, thrivemarket.com slash curiously veg. That will take you to our, uh, our affiliate site so you can sign up. Mm-hmm. Helps us out. Um, again, paying free for, month. Yeah, you get a free month. Uh, anything over 50 bucks is free shipping, and uh, it helps us out, you know, with equipment. And we just had to, we actually had to buy some software to handle the recording for uh, the interview you guys yeah. uh, saw. Hopefully, we plan on putting this up on, on, YouTube. on YouTube. Our first YouTube. Yay! Yay! Which means that means now we have to do more. Yay! <laughs> so we're gonna be, we'll, we'll, we'll break the fourth wall quite a bit. So. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, and if you really want to see Dave dress up in a Deadpool outfit, you should probably you know message us and say you want to see Dave dress up in a Deadpool uh, outfit. me for things. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so yeah, check, check out check out the check out Thai Market. Uh, we'll have a, our affiliate link also in the show mm-hmm. notes. So. So um, you, you know it's it's great. You can order delicious cheese delivered to you. You can get your goods delivered to you. You can get your books delivered to you. It's like we live. We, we, we're offering utopia can, here. Yeah, uh, lose. So going talking about her and her dog, what I found interesting, it's that's very similar to his um, fox his story, former story right. which is fantastic. And uh, kind of if, if you were kind of recap that. I, well, when they opened the, uh, the when they got their rescue going, the sanctuary going, right across from them was a fur farm, a fox fur farm. And you know, I, I'm so glad that Jean didn't take the approach of going over there and saying you're a horrible person. You Which know, is very she, easy to do. Yeah, and we have that's a lot of that. I, I don't really, it's not really my thing. I don't think you get a good message across. But I think he handled it in the absolute best way possible, which was inviting him to come to some of the events that they had and to meet the animals. To where he just told him, I don't, I can't do this anymore. I don't, I don't feel good about killing these animals. So he closed the fur farm and started raising food. He goes, what do you, what do you like? You know, and I'm saying that, that that's what makes a big difference. Right. It, it really does because um, we have to. It's like we told him, you have to have compassion for ourselves and other people too. And a lot of people are either they're not educated about it, they've just never had the experience to touch or feel or be around an animal. And uh, so screaming at them and tell, nobody wants to be told they're wrong. Right. But just showing them a different way, I think, is is the best way to do it. And that's what we do here at Curiously Veg. Right. Absolutely. And it's and that's um and, and that's. There's two things to that. So one, it's a lot like we say is lead by example mm-hmm. and lead through positivity. Right. Right. And it, it's and that's the thing that um, you know you've you did with me and I've I've tried doing with others around me of, of not pushing things on people and you know and again people who who are are extremely passionate and do the protesting and the walks they have their place that um, you know, we found that for us and even for him mm-hmm. that uh, the, the the most uh, uh, effective way is just kind of being there, being open, and, and, and sharing. Well, making a point to being around animals, to understand what factory farming does. And it's not necessary for us. We talked to him, too, about uh, the lab-created meat, which that right. could open a door for the animals that we have that are in need of to eat meat. You know, that that's a good outlet for it, and we kind of touched on that. Um, but it's, it's kind of like you said about you know, killing animals. If you don't do anything that you wouldn't have done to you, right? Right. Yeah. So, that, and that's the whole thing about you know, I, everyone says like, well, I want humane meat. You know, so at the, not, a lot of people, right? <laughs> and that, they again had the had the T-shirt that says there, there, uh, uh, humane meat is a myth. It's a unicorn. And uh, I, I need to get that shirt. I love that shirt. But uh, and and you just want a unicorn. That's true. But the the thing about it is is thing about it is is what think about the thing that's being done. If you don't want it done to you, then it's not humane. So you know, and the initial thought was like, well, you live in a field and eat your natural diet, grass. So it's so cows example. I would say, that's fantastic. I would, you know, like, yeah, okay. But do you want to be led, led down a hallway and if, with all of your essentially friends or family members? Because again, cows have the mentality of a three, four year old. Yeah. So they 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 make partnerships. They have strong strong groups. They strong, have strong best group. friends. Yeah, cows have, have best friends. Absolutely. They really do. And and uh, and you know you know. Bolt to the head, or let you and all that stuff. You know, does that, that something you want done to you? No. Okay. And then sometimes that's they're not, not humane. Dead. And sometimes they don't die. Right. And that's it's, and again, that's not a rarity. Um, and then, and that's that's not humane. 
So my whole thing is if I looked at it, especially when, when I was considering veganism, because I was one of those people that said, like, oh, I can never be vegan. I, th- those words came out of my mouth. Right. I, I love cheese, and I was raised on this. But thinking about my choices in life, it, whether it comes to your health, you, using drugs, alcohol, not exercising, things like that, trying to make the best decision for yourself and thinking, if, if I don't need it, why should I have it in my life? If it's right. not necessary for my survival, it's not oxygen. Right. Animal products, it's not oxygen. If right. I, I can live, I, and obviously we do. Um, right, yeah, I'm, I'm done okay. I'm almost, I'm four years in, so yeah. Yeah. I think, I'm thinking I'm doing all right. So, and, and we see that in bodybuilders. A lot of athletes are coming out. A lot of celebrities are, are com- coming out of the pantry. Um, yeah, Patrick, Patrick Baboumian is, you know. Yeah, argue with that. Right? Yeah, right. He, he called out Joe Rogan, I which know, I thought was funny. Uh, I mean, I'm waiting, yeah. And we but, hear back about that. He has this thing back. But, yeah. uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's, and again, we, you know, talking, you know, having, and with that, there's no absolutes. You know, some people, like, I, I didn't jump. Like I had a little bit of a stepping, a little bit of a stepping stone, kind of slowly went. Then eventually, I was like, I'm done. Yeah. Uh, you jump. You were vegetarian for a while, so that jump right into veganism wasn't wasn't I don't think that abrasive. But uh, for most people, you know, we talked to how there's a you know, young lady uh, at the uh, at Whole Foods we go to, and I asked her like, how's the diet going? You know, I use from diet, but it's not. It's a lifestyle. And uh, she's like, I just I couldn't do it. It's like okay, well it's okay, it's okay. You fell off. Just get back on the wagon. You know, if you any questions, let me know. Step, step, into step it. in, one step at a time. Slowly start phasing things in, and essentially phasing things. Kind of, you, the word, words you use is crowding things out. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so it, it it it's 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 no absolutes. You know, I've I've never wagged my finger like you're not big enough because you didn't. You're still doing this. Okay, it's a stepping stone. Well, nobody's working. nobody's perfect. Even, even not. the even the vegans even, that think they are, they're you're you're not perfect. It's, well, isn't a perfect. That out. Yeah, and I think that. The best thing that they that everybody can do is kind of step into the truth and and shows like this where, where we spotlight people like Jean who do fantastic work. Expose yourself to this and then ask yourself the questions that we're asking. Ask yourself, are you you know the curiously veg questions? Are you are you okay with this? Would you want this done to you? Right. It's like the the pig skit. Oh, the pig skit. That yeah, was yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, and, and it, it's funny because you see people and it just shows how how much we have a cognitive dissonance. They're in a grocery store. There was this guy and. He, uh, he has sausage, and they try it. Oh, this is great. He goes, oh, you want me to sell you some? And they're, you know, say yeah. So he pulls some, it's a, it's a big box. He cranks it, and sausage comes out. The first one's like, oh, this isn't good. I'm going to reload it. There's none. So he grabs a baby pig, sticks it down the box, and they start freaking out. Of right. course, there's a woman in the box that's holding the pig and feeding. Right, and there's fake squeals and stuff. And yeah. he was he was trying to tell them, well, that's what you're eating. And they're like, well, we don't want that. He goes, no, that's what you're eating. And yeah, they, it's and just it that, that breakup. Yeah, and I think that that's that's what we have to do is just not not so much in your face and telling people wrong, but just show them this is this is what the reality of it is. These are your choices. Nobody's telling you the choices to make, but these are what your choices spawn. Well, it's kind of like you and I talk about like off, like off the record sometimes. It's like is <laughs> off the show is, is you know it's is is thinking things logically through. And, that, and that's one I think logically. So you know, taking and it's hard to do. You know, especially you know, we're emotional, emotional animals. Taking the emotion out of it, and just thinking logically. There's a thought experiment that's done. Uh, psycho- psychologists do to see if someone is a, a psychopath. <laughs> and it's uh. It, so what did you score? Anyway, <laughs> but, <I'm just> <laughs> but the, the thought experiment is if if there's five people on a train track and a train's barreling down on them, you can't and they can't move. The train is gonna keep moving. You They're can't try, stop the tie down like the old silent. Thing. Yeah, something like that. There's nothing you can do. Only thing you do is flip the switch to move the train to another track. And on the other track is is a, is a one person tied up. That you can't say anything. Nothing you can do except pull the lever. Would you pull the lever? And most people would say most people say yes. Like yeah, I mean it's. I, I can either let five die or be responsible for one. Obviously, you know. Then it, it becomes a Spock thing when he dies. Right. Yeah. right. You know, and and the, what's interesting is there you can go further with that. So you have pigs, cows, chickens, turkeys, all that on a train track can't move. They're 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 in a crate or whatever. They can't move, right? Train barreling down on them, and you can flip a switch to doing a hit. But on the other track, there's nothing. There's nothing. That's it. So why don't you just why why not flip the switch? Right. That's it. You, you're not you're not losing anything. And the switch that we have is what we've been programmed, whether it's right. cultural or through marketing, because you know my my, my I, I'm a, I was a marketing major, so you get to see marketing and PR, you get to see all the things that they do, and it really is designed to make you do certain things, Absolutely. to make you buy, and you're not conscious of it. it. It's how it's promoted, 
and we've been thinking this way, like the got milk commercial. Right. We know. I mean, there we don't. You don't have to take up what we're saying for face value. You can look at the studies. Dairy is detrimental to our health. Sure. It it degrades your health on so many levels. Um, but they can spawn their own studies or pull from abstracts or they right. pay for people to say got milk. And I don't understand, especially athletes going out there. Really. You're going to promote that. And well, you know. a lot of them are on the same the same page, and they're they're, they're following they're the same. They're brainwashed with it, yeah. Right. So, and and I, I've, I've worked with agencies for for years, and you know, I'm a web developer, but I you know, I work with a lot of the marketing teams coming so up. So you that drink is Mountain Dew and eat Cheetos. All right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> God. Um, but uh, you know, I, I work with the marketing teams. It's like, okay, we have a product for you know X, and I was you know, I'm not going to say a certain product. We have a product for X, and figure out how we can. Use imagery and text and placement images and how big the buttons need to be and doing and doing some A/B testing and figuring out what part of that marketing makes someone go oh okay and click or you know, read that article and things like that. So make make it a I cultural it norm. I understand I've been involved with it. <laughs> yeah, make it a cultural norm because anybody like us we we are seen as outsiders. Right, exactly. And nobody wants to be the outsider. You want to be because a lot of people say, well, you know, if I'm vegan, my social life is gone. And I'm like, well, you need a better social life. Right. Yeah, you need better friends. Yeah. Friends who understand and and, and we and have meeting, we have meeting friends that, that sure. don't even bat an eye with us. They don't they don't bring it up if we go eat. They don't. It's not a big topic. And those are the people that you need to look for. Right. That, and they're conscious of our diet. And, they're like, hey, well, can we go? You can have something. Like, oh, awesome. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go to Mellow Mushroom. We have pizza. You know, whatever. So yeah. And so that's 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 where we have kind of have to shift. And I think that's what we talked about with James. We have to shift the conversation. We have to raise awareness. We kind of have to have people exposed to the truth sure. in what's happening. And let, because I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just here to bring the information, and you're responsible for your own choices. Precisely, yeah. And I think one thing you can do to kind of get your information get it, is reading like books, like jeans and magazines, publications mm-hmm. that focus on those things. Like you read, you you're, you're reading through Jean's book, and what, uh, what 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 are some stuff that really stood out to you? Just, I mean, it's stuff we already know, but. The treatment of the animals, um, and just how it's almost almost seen as these animals don't have feelings, they don't think, and they're disposable. Is it is it something in your opinion that a someone uh, when they get healthier understands the uh, the the industry would would would, would, be easy, would would it be something for these for them to easier to read and yes. grasp? It it gives you insight almost from an animal's perspective of it's not it's not a it's not a shocking cruel thing right it just kind of gives it opens it opens that door to make you realize here's what's going on but he's compassionate in it he has recipes that are really good i mean these these are these are easy to read books and it's like i said i got so engrossed i was walking around with, i have it on my kindle <laughs> and i'm walking around the house and actually ran into the wall man asked me did you really want to run into the walls like to heaven i've done this before you know right. but if, even, 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 even when you're not reading you tend to run into walls this is this point. is true <laughs> um but yeah he, I'm, I'm probably gonna pay he's got another book out called uh, farm sanctuary changing the hearts and minds right. about animals and food Food, um, that was out in 2008, so I'll probably be picking that up when right. I, because you know, I'm reading like eight books at a time. <laughs> and I'm going to shameless plug this, this fact that you know we're working on our magazine as well that will include interviews like with Jean, also will include mm-hmm. uh, recipes, studies, uh, research that we and our and the writers that we're going to have with us. And if you would like to be a writer with the magazine, contact, you, contact us, uh, kirstyvegradio.com. Mm-hmm. Click on the contact at the top. It will move you down to a form. Just hey, I want to be a writer, writer with the magazine. We would love to, uh, you know, put add you to the list when we're ready. Start having you uh, put something together with us. Well, the positive of this, what makes me feel really good in this day and age, even through all the bad things that's happening, is like he was he was showcased in a new magazine called Compassionate Man. It's the GQ of veganism. We have that now. Yes. We have a magazine out that, and it kind of you know having that because you know GQ is supposedly masculine. Well, this is showing that. Veganism is not masculine, but it's compassion. It's, it's it's a great thing. But having all of this stuff, these these books that are out, having them showcased on John Stewart, John Stewart opening up his own right. Sanctuary. And actually, Gene's working with Jan, John Stewart and his wife to right. do it. His wife has a book out as well. We we talked about uh, on a previous show before. Yeah. So all of this stuff is coming light. So it's showing that people are starting to be curious. Yeah. They're curiously yeah. veg. Yeah. Uh, see how through that work, in? Work that in. Working that in. Throwing out, throwing out some stuff. Matt, just move him over a little Sorry. bit. <laughs> um, but it, it's kind of showing that we, we are having a shift, at least in the at least here. But we're also seeing it over the world. We're seeing places that are primarily that have always been heavily meat eaters starting to be more vegan. So 
is happening, which is good. I wish it would happen faster, but I'm just right. I'm so stoked that we have all this out. And because 10 years ago we didn't have any of this. I mean, it was really hard pressed to find stuff. You know, when we finally got our veg fest here, I was like, you, I called you. I was like, we have a veg fest here. We so had a go. Let's go out. And hey, <laughs> the first time we went, you ta- so much. You, you talk to people and you turn around and look at me and I'm like, eating. You're like, what are you eating now? <laughs> I'm like, fried peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You're like, do you want a bite? Okay. <laughs> it's like it's like I could walk around and eat everything. I don't have to ask questions. This is amazing. Yeah, this past Veg Fest, there was so much food. Absolutely. And we're looking for I'm looking forward to the one this year. Oh, we got the one in uh, Nashville too that we're gonna head out to. Yeah. In a couple gonna, months, just yeah. got it out. Yeah. yeah. Hint, hint. Excited. Nashville Veg Fest. Actually, Nashville, if you'd like to uh, maybe have us record a show or do a talk, uh, reach out to us. Be awesome. Okay. Yeah, no, selfishly pimping ourselves. I, I, there, I have no shame in that. I know you have no shame, <laughs> but. But anyway. But yeah, so you know, we we are heading in a positive spin to wrap this, you know, wrap this up, and because we're gonna get food now, because I'm hungry. You get hungry. Um, but um, in this day and age, we have people like Gene Bauer who are are working very hard to help our movement. We have so much stuff out. We have between magazines and food. Uh, shows podcasts like this one podcasts even if you look on on shows on TV you find some, a character that's vegan right so we're making yep. positive change and making waves and we're kicking ass and taking names we're getting there we're getting there Starbucks has coconut milk it's crazy and, that, and I just said that I have to change our uh, explicit advisory on the show no I'm just kidding. <laughs> it could be a donkey that's, that's true <laughs> we're kicking but anyway I don't want to kick a donkey I like donkeys <laughs> Donkey kickens and taking names. This is what happens when hope, when hope gets hungry. Well, I've had too much sugar. That's awesome. This true. is your fault. Yeah. Actually, no, it's the Starbucks. I asked. They didn't, I said, they didn't I said unsweeten mine. Yeah. They didn't unsweeten it. Like it's a magic thing they wave over it. Yes. So, so yeah. So we're going to get food. But yeah, visit our website. KirstyVegRadio.com. Try some delicious cheese. Absolutely. At pure, PureAbundanceFood.com. And try the Thrive Market. See what you can. You know, try new foods. Go in there and order it. Get Jean's book. Read it. Give it a review. Absolutely. We, we love it, so I'm sure we're sure you will too. Yeah, it's, it's, it is it is a good read. I, I can promise you would enjoy it. It's not shocking or anything. Just it's it's a, it's an enjoyable read. Absolutely. So send us out. Send us out. Are we are we asking are we asking the question? We ask the question. Ask the question to yourself. Are you curiously, curiously veg? veg? And bye guys. Bye, 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 bye. <laughs>